I've done my research. I know he's a farmer. He's a good one at that. I heard other, other adjectives as I spoke with people here and I read online. Um, family man, community leader, organizer, advocate, selfless, successful, which is important. I also heard um, another term that resonates even back in Boston, a Mississippi native. There's a lot of folks from there back in Boston gardening. Um, so a hello from them. <laughs> um, a globetrotter, uh, a presenter at the United Nations. Um, he's been to Europe, Africa, West and Southeast Asia, Central America. I'm sure I'm missing something, Ben. <laughs> Small farmers, cooperatives, education, financial advisor, and a legislator. Then as I began to understand the work Ben has embraced, I started writing some nouns of my own. Creative, a student, an educator, inventive, curious, honest, and generous. Roll all these things together and you'll begin to see a picture of how Ben lives his life. I can only aspire to have a life so deeply rooted in my truth, to give so much of myself for the good of all. Ben has mastered the art of weaving together his work, his friendships, his time, his passion, and his vision. Today, the corporate world has set up and utilizes an effective way to share their individual progress, and their colleagues build on each other's successes. I have lately often wondered, how do nonprofits do this? Do they do it? How do farmers do it? Back in India, where I grew up, and in Africa, where Ben's been very active, are they swapping their stories when the rain fails? How does Syed from Boston share his stories with Julius in New Bedford, both um, um, advocating for immigrant farmers? How does Le Leslie in Massachusetts work with the Ag Department in Zimbabwe around GMO seeds? How does Ben? How do you do it, Ben? And why does he do it? Why does he start these conversations across these continents? How and why does he make that time to do it? How does a man continue to farm in a local cooperative and work with legislators across the world to represent their needs? Hopefully we will learn some of this from him today. So I introduce to you Ben. The sister was introducing me, I wonder who she was talking about. <laughs> you know, most of the time when I have opportunity to speak in the north, uh, you'll have to have an interpreter. Because <laughs> I'm speaking with a southern accent. But indeed, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank uh, Kathleen for inviting me, Julie and Jack, the opportunity to be here and all the time that you couldn't contact me because I stay in a, a rural area where the, my cell phone only work when I'm on the outside. And we, don't, we don't, do not have high-speed internet yet. But as I look out over the audience today and I chose for a topic to speak, uh, why family farm matters. And you know, I, I, I was, they talk about black lives matter, police matters. And one in my neck of the woods said, rebels matter. I'm talking about them Confederate rebels. So they got these bumper stickers that say, rebel lives matter. But I don't think no lives matter without family farmers. We provide the essential of life, food, fiber. We produce crops, animals, and we try to do it sustainable. And indeed, a pleasure to be here in an organization such as this great organization, the organization that I come from the Federation of Southern Cooperative, the National Family Union, La Viva Capacino, Slow Food, and the list go on and on and on. What we are trying to impress upon the consumer, the value of family farming. I come from a farming, I'm a fourth generation family farmer. The land I farm on was acquired by my great-grandfather in 1889 in South Mississippi. 
And they said, after slavery, you were promised 40 acres and a mule. And in that part of the South, in Mississippi, black farmers, black people, I should say, only 20 years after the Civil War was able to acquire land. The land I have is, is, was, is a homestead. George Tidday was granted 164 acres on the Homestead Act, and many other families in that region was granted. So I did a little research. I'm trying to figure out how were they able to acquire this land so quickly after the Civil War. And it, it goes back to the Trail of Tears. The Native American was forced to move to Oklahoma. And this land was opened up for settlement. And fortunately, there was some black people was able to acquire homestead. And I have in my possession the document signed by President Grover Cleveland himself granting that land to my family. So the, the mere fact to even hold on to it through Jim Crow, segregation, and now that Fame Farm is 300 and 322 acres. So we'd like for that to continue. As family farmers, and those of you here that produce crops, you can know what the struggle can be. You know, we have companies now that want to control the seeds. We had other companies that want to control the marketplace. And we have some corporations that want to control everything in the whole world. Last month, I was fortunate to be a observing delegate to the World Trade Organization meeting in Nairobi, Kenya. And we protested and we protested. And the outcome was very sad. You had the global south being dictated by the north and the United States, the European Union, Australia, all the developed country won't still control the North, the South. And I, I have to be careful how I say because this is the greatest country in the world. I wouldn't want to live no other place than the United States of America. Or the, or the infamous great state of Mississippi for that matter. Because this is, is a great country to be in. But we have imposed our will on other countries. And when it comes to trade. And I guess when you do only remain in superpower, you can do that. But we are living in an age and a time now where what, done, what you do here in Massachusetts can affect farmers in Africa, in India. Look at global warming. Look at trade. They said trade should be fair and equitable, but it's not. Even if you look at the situation we are in and the climate, uh, the way we care about the soil, the air, the water, believe me, all those have to be taken care of. And it began with farming. The oldest profession in the world, planting seeds, taking care of animals. And we are here for a reason as farmers, as family farmers. We're given the opportunity to provide a service to our fellow man. And we should treat it that way because we are all involved. If you look, go back and, and, you, and you've seen that picture where you see from the space shell and you see this blue planet. You see the water, your air. And it made it surreal that whatever we do, we are affecting somebody. And therefore, we should treat everybody as we want it to be treated. Labor issues, with farm workers, how valuable they are to what we do. You know, we say we are a family farmer. And it's been very hard to define what is a family farm because we say, you are USDA say anybody with less than 250,000 in sales. So 
Some other place said less than $500,000 in sale. Some would say, well, what the family provide all the management and labor. So it's hard to, to say what is a family farm. But my definition of a family farm is a farm that supply what it needs for its family and provide for a local food sovereign area. What simply means you should be given the right to decide what you want to produce, how you want to produce it in a given area. Not dictated by supply and demand or by multinational corporations. And when I say uh, food sovereignty, I'm talking about energy, the way energy is produced, food, the climate, the, the neighborhood, the jobs and everything. That should be left up to you to make that decision. I come from a small town called Petal, P-E-T-A-L, Mississippi, and I belong to my local cooperative there. And we, hit, we, we began working cooperative many, many years ago, over 40 years ago. And most of the cooperatives in the South, especially those of Ar Amer African American black, grew out of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, we had to, we had to, we achieved the right to vote, but we still need to achieve the right to survive. As a, you know, so we had this land, so we continue that tradition of farming and working together. And then you look at the future of agriculture. What's the future you like to see agriculture? Again, family farmers matters in the future. We must take care of this land that we have so that we can pass it on to another generation. As I travel around the world in, in the Sisters of State, I've been blessed. <clears throat> when I was growing up in the segregated South, anybody would have told me that I'd have been speaking at a university in Massachusetts, I wouldn't have believed them. <laughs> on sustainable agriculture and agriculture price. I at the UN, or at the World Trade Organization, or in a small village in East Africa, or with coffee farmers in Honduras, or sugar farmers in Cuba. And in the workshop I was in earlier, it said, why we as farmers are not uh, looked up on like movie star <laughs> and like politicians. Why our profession is not like lawyers. And I don't know, and the lawyers in the room, you know, I can tell you a bunch of bad jokes about lawyers they use in the South. <laughs> Why farming and being a farmer is not looked upon as a great profession. In the South, during the Great Migration North, all the black people were leaving the South because of farming. Now they are returning because of farming. They went to Chicago, Boston, New York. They have worked for John Deere, General Motors, and Ford, and they're returning home. Some are even buying the same farm that they share cropped on and returning back to their root. So I think we should elevate farmers in this country to a status of where when I walk, I can... Because <laughs> farmers, without farmers, what would we be? You know, you, everybody have to eat and wear clothes most of the time. <laughs> So let's make farmers proud to be a farmer. In the country of Cuba, that's the most honorable and highest respected profession anyone can be in, to be a farmer. So let's look at it that way. And there's also the movement of, now we want to know where our food comes from, who produced it. And I can understand that. And I, I rarely look at television. 
But there's so many shows now on television about cooking. I mean, I'm looking at in the airport, the greatest hamburger in the United States. And they have the, what is the Iron Chef, and it just go on and on and on. And I'm wondering when all these shows on television, they never say anything about where the, the, the leafy lettuce they get come from, or where the beef they get using these hamburgers, or how the bread was processed. So, the, and, and in this great city of New Orleans, I have my cooperative league, we have about six high-end restaurants down there. Anybody know Commander's Palace, or the Brennan family, or what's the one on, on television? Emory Lagasse, Del Monaco, all of those are chefs and restaurants we sell to. So the movement is, is here. How can we build on it between great organizations such as you all and my organization in the South? How can we continue to get the consumer to be more aware about their food? I wanted to plant soybeans three years ago or four years ago. I could not find no GMO seeds because all the seed dealers in the area said, why you want to plant that override? So I had to search high and low between three states to come up with 150 sacks of non-GMO soybean seed. Now, it should be, seeds should be in the public domain for our concern. <laughs> you know, no, no, no company should have the right to say, this is my soybean seed. So I'm trying to figure out how can you say that? Where did you get the seed plaza? I guess Monsanto just created a soybean seed in the lab. Uh, uh, corn or wheat. So it all had to start from somewhere. So we need to provide the funding for our public institutions to do the research. And when seeds of higher quality to produce, it should be in the public domain. But again, I, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, farming is a way of life and those of us that like to farm. And some of us, we were kind of tricked into farming. At least I was. <laughs> I graduated from Alcorn State University with a degree in agriculture. And at the time, they were teaching us to use Monsanto products, Roundup Ready, uh, Cynics. So I go back to my father and I introduced them to chemical <laughs> that I was taught at the land grant university all the time they were making good crops without it but I thought since I had a what is it a BS degree <laughs> <laughs> I was educated <laughs> so it was my intention to follow that great migration to Chicago in 1972. But I farmed that year. And in the South, the way they usually say, your mother or your father, somebody financed you the first year. And maybe the second year, but the third year, you're on your own. So I made so much money, $8,000, <laughs> to be exact, clear money. After I paid it, I said, this farming might be pretty good, so I stay. Little did I know in, in 10 years, well, we had the farm crisis. And many of you might don't remember when 60,000 tractors came to Washington, D.C. And we were driving around and around the capital. We was only able to send one from the Federation of Southern Cooperative. We all put, pitched in our little money, sent one African American farmer from Mississippi to be in that. So I struggled through the 80s. And I kind of realized what I was doing was not sustainable. Using chemicals, growing cotton, soybeans. So I, I scaled back 
and chemical if you farming using chemical it's just like you hooked on uh I won't say marijuana because I hope they legalize it in Mississippi pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> like you hooked on a drug. So you have to, it took you 20 years to get on the, that way, and it's going to take you 20 years <laughs> to get off. So it took me about 15 years. So my farm now is chemical free except a little fungicide sometimes. So it can be done. I'm a living example. And to provide a living of, on full-time farming operation. Let me say a few words about the future. We need to prepare another generation. As you can see, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm 64 years old. And, and normally in a farm of uh, my type, mid-sized operation, about 40 years, you begin the process of turning it over to another generation. By well, simply, I mean you go to the FSA office and you take your name off of the farm track number and you put, in my case, my daughter name and you, you ease your way out and another generation come in. So you try to leave the farm in a, in a, in a good situation. When it let it, it least amount of debt as you possibly can. The soil in as good a shape as it was when you received it for the next generation. So we have to be preparing the next generation that want to farm to be able to farm as a family farm institution. And we have to begin that with the consumers, with the farmer, with the universities, and we definitely have to rein in these free trade agreements. You got the ITP, the Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, and one that almost put me out of business was NAFTA. Because we were growing hot peppers and cucumbers and uh, okra for processing. The year NAFTA was signed, we lost all of that production. So we have to be concerned about not only what affects us here in the United States, but when we see agreements like the Internet, the ITP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they say it's going to create so many jobs. How many times have we been told that? This agreement is going to create 60,000 new jobs. We're going to lose 60,000 new jobs. So we have to con continue to work together with the understanding that this is one world and we all have a part in it. I'm going to conclude with a, a farmer's prayer. You know, in the, in the, in the South, a meeting of this size, we probably would have prayed at least three different times. <laughs> We'd have prayed. And the other, when we first, for breakfast, we would pray before we started this meeting, and we would definitely pray on the end. But when I was about 10 or 12 years old, and I'd go to these farm meetings, and I'd have, I memorized this prayer. I'm not going to give y'all the Baptist version. I'm going to kind of cut it short. <laughs> you know, I, Baptist prayer is 30 minutes. But it said, it goes, it said, Our Father which I in heaven, this land which I have been given for only a short while, the stewardship of it, that I may leave it in a better shape than that which I received it. For I know at one time I must stick my sword in the sea of time. I will not study this wall no more. I will not farm this land. I will go to that great farm of all farms where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, where the streets are paved with gold, milk and honey is abound, that I may journey from this life to that farm of all farms, that place that we call heaven, 
where we can live there eternally and in peace. Amen. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ben Burkett. Uh, we'll do 15 minutes of question and answer if anyone has any questions about farming and what's going on in Mississippi. Otherwise, you're dismissed for lunch. Enjoy it. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. It's, hopefully this is live. Thank you so much, Ben. It's, it's wonderful friend. to see you again. <laughs> see you again. And I was hoping you could tell us just a little bit more about how your co-op is organized in your town and the relationship between that co-op and the Federation. Yes, my cooperative in the Spring Farm Association is, is the local cooperative. And it is, is a member of the Mississippi Association of the Cooperative, which is 24 cooperatives and one in each state. And the state is cooperative, make up the Federation of Southern Cooperative. The Federation of Southern Cooperative is 13 states, from Texas to South Carolina. And each one of those states have a board member on the Federation of Southern Cooperative. So you go from the local cooperative to the state association to the Federation, which is the regional association of all these 56 cooperatives. And most of, all of those cooperatives grew out of the Civil Rights Movement. They were organized because of racism, uh, because of market access, and that's how they evolved around. Um, just to follow up on that, is your what portion of the of the food chain does your cooperative um, address? Is it a farmers co-op or does it address marketing and all the way through? Yes, uh, most of our local our cooperative they do some farmer markets, regional, uh, national, and some international. We have sent products to Canada, Nicaragua, and the Gambia, West Africa. We have a relationship too with cooperative in Gambia, uh, Senegal, and Zimbabwe. And we have a signed agreement with the Cuban government for Cuban black beans. So a little bit of black beans. I grow big black beans <laughs> in the south. But I have learned how to grow those small ones and we can mechanical harvest them. And we hope to send three containers to Cuba this year. Another question? Hands please. Oh, here we go. Can I really appreciate you being here and bringing your very long perspective in agriculture. And my question is about, um, you went through the farm crisis and while so many family farmers lost the farm, first, how, what did you see in the region around you and how that affected the farming in that area and how did you get through it and were able to um, go forward and continue farming and really make it through that crisis. That was a very tough time too. We lost a number of farmers. Uh, in my area, uh, farmers started out barn from, it was the Farmers Home Administration then, I believe, now it's the Farms, Farms FSA now. And what happened, farmers, especially black farmers, you know, in the the uh, Pickford lawsuit, it was discrimination there because black farmers, you would get an operating loan and the only, only way you could spend the money, you had to go get a countersign from the FSA 
offers before you could even spend your money. So I seen in 1984 that wasn't working too well. So I said, best thing for me to do, try to uh, pay, off, pay off FSA, then go do business with the Production Credit Association or uh, Federal Land Bank, which, was, which, which made it a little better, but they credit, you had to have number one credit basically do business with those two. So you either had good credit or you had very good assets. <laughs> and land, basically, that you were willing to, to, to put up in order to continue your farming operation. And I had a banker, uh, Hugh Garraway, in his heart he thought he was a real good man, but he probably was but he was a number one racist. But he really took a lacking to me for some reason. <laughs> and he navigated me through this system of doing business <laughs> with banks in Mississippi. And he, the only problem I, I had with him, and I can talk all in, in his mind, by me being a black man, I had a ceiling there. I couldn't borrow a hundred thousand. He just couldn't see me bond two or three or uh, half a million dollars just because he, f he thought I wouldn't be able to manage it, I guess. But we had a many, many man-to-man -man discussion after I didn't owe his bank any money. <laughs> 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 About those situations like that. And we would all go back and forth. <laughs> so you have to, how I was able to survive, I, I couldn't answer that. I had family support. And many of the farmers I know that did survive, they had family here in Boston or in Chicago that were making good money. And when they couldn't make the note on the equipment or land, they would send that money back to Georgia and the South Carolina and the Mississippi. So it was a family support. That's all I can say. I met many, many farms I know in Mississippi was saved that way. Cause they had 13 children, 500 acre farm, only two on the place. The other 10 scattered up north. They had possibly good paying job. They were working at Caterpillar and, and John Mansfield and all those other companies. And you know, back then it was union wages and they was, when they couldn't make that note in December, those other family members would, would help out. Well, I want to thank everybody here and thank our speaker. One more question. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to thank you for those inspiring words, and I was thrilled that you, your comments about Cuba, even though they were not in detail. Uh, my colleagues and I from the Urban Farming Institute, we are actively planning for a trip to Cuba, and my question to you is, uh, if you have any words of wisdom as to how to make that uh, trip, which is really related to uh, agriculture, how to make that even more uh, um, fruitful <laughs> and, and worthwhile. And I will, lastly, I, I want to say that I want your autograph because I think you're going to play yourself in the story of the food uh, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the movie. <laughs> I don't know about the second part, but the first part, <laughs> Cuba is a very fascinating country and it, they've been able to survive without chemicals. They couldn't get them in the first place. So they have learned how to really produce using what technology they have. It's my understanding that the city of Havana, 60% of what is consumed in Havana is grown within the city limits of Havana. So you, the Association of Cuban Farmers, the one organization you definitely want to meet with while you're down in Cuba, and they have an urban uh, movement of uh, growing in Cuba. But they took what they had, and you could, uh, 
I've been several times. They, they took all the land that they, anywhere they can plant something, they planted something. And they didn't have the access, which I hope under the president administration, when we start going and coming to Cuba, that they don't lose what they have. Because if we get it, if they let us in too much, Monsanto <laughs> will send them several containers of seed and just give them to them to get them to start buying. And I would hate to see that. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating country. You'll learn a lot, especially about urban production, how to utilize what you have.